Amen. Good morning. How are you this morning? Amen. What an incredible time of worship. Can we just give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning? Amen. God is so faithful and so good. Hey, we're honored to have you here with us this morning. So many new faces, and uh, we're excited. Those who have come to see uh, and be a part of Carson's baptism this morning, we're honored to have you. I just pray that you, uh, you feel the Holy Spirit here and that you just allow God to do something incredible in your life. That's for all of us this morning. And so if you're here and uh, maybe it's the first time you've, you're visiting with us or uh, maybe you, you've, you've been here for the last several weeks, you'll know this, but we've been in a sermon series for the last several weeks. Matter of fact, this is the 10th sermon we've had uh, on the final countdown. It's been a sermon series about what we as believers can expect at the end of times. And we've tried to raise awareness the last several weeks about what's really going on in the world because so many, uh, both Christians and uh, non-Christians or non-believers, unbelievers, uh, we have our head in the sand, just to be honest with you. We don't know what's going on. We kind of just live in our own world, kind of do our own thing. And although we do uh, walk by faith and not by sight, Jesus says specifically that when you see these things happening, you will know that he is near. As a matter of fact, he said, when you see these things happening, you'll know that I'm at the very gate. And so this has been um, a great few weeks. I think some of the things you've learned uh, about the New World Order and those things are moving uh, rapidly. As I said, this is the first time I've ever done a series that involved these current and world events and uh, some, some of the political events as well. You've learned about that New World Order. You've learned about what BRICS the BRICS nation, as you saw this video, some of you are wondering, what in the world is Pastor John playing on the screen? Some kind of statue? Now, that was the vision that Daniel had, Nebuchadnezzar's vision in Daniel chapter 2. And it's amazing that you can look through secular history and you can see that starting with the Babylonians all the way through the Roman Empire, that those pieces of that vision, they happened exactly, exactly the way Daniel described them. And when you got to the end, you saw the only thing left that hasn't been prophetically revealed were the toes. The ten toes, I believe that those are the ten kings, as Daniel says in chapter 2 and talks about even more uh, in chapters 9, 10, 11, and 12, but also in Revelation John calls them the ten horns. And so those ten kings, I believe they'll be in effect January the 4th as uh, the BRICS nation is uh, moving at a fast pace. But, you know, as we've went through this, um, we've learned that it's just a matter of time before the Antichrist makes his appearance, that things that Jesus has told us is going to happen, that they're going to happen. And it doesn't matter how big of a prayer warrior you may think you are, how in tune with the Holy Spirit you think you are, you're not going to be able to pray what God has told us is going to happen. You're not going to be able to pray that out. You're not going to be able to get away from it. You're not going to be able to run from it because God's ordained it. And as we talk about the final countdown and we see these things, the one thing you've learned the last few weeks is Jesus is coming back. He's closer now than he's ever been. And so this morning we, we're going to, do what we've done uh, the last several weeks. We're going to read some scriptures together. And then we're going to give you these last uh, few points. Uh, because this, for some, has created some fear in, in some of you in the room. It's like, what if Jesus comes back tomorrow? Even had one person, as we talked several weeks ago, and before you take a deep breath, of a gasp for air, when somebody says, hey, if Jesus comes back tomorrow, it's going to mess up my plans. It's going to mess up my plans. It's going to mess up my plans for my family. It's going to mess up my things. And so, you know, before you realize that, uh, you say, well, gosh, who would say something like that? Probably most everybody in the room. If Jesus comes back tomorrow, what about this? What about that? And unfortunately, that's where so many people who call themselves followers of Christ really are. We didn't get up this morning. We got up this morning to come to church. We got up this morning to come to Carson's baptism. We got up this morning to, to just go through the motions, whatever they may be. But did we really get up expecting that Jesus could come back today? The reality is most people who call themselves followers of Christ didn't get up with the expectation, come Lord Jesus, come. You were thinking about what you got to do today, where you got to be by what time, uh, how much chicken they're going to have at Jack's when we get out, all kind of things. And so this morning for these next few moments, we hope to be able just to give you a very simple message. Uh, the last few weeks, several things have been pretty complex, but this morning it's pretty simple. 
Some of you who are living in fear, you're wondering, what if Jesus comes back? What do I do? What, what do I do? We're going to address that this morning. So if you'll stand to your feet across the house, if you're new here, our team has done incredible. Our congregation, our members here have done incredible reading Scripture together in time. We actually stay in time. It's incredible. And we read, and we've done this for the last several weeks, and so we're going to finish this up. The only difference this morning is where the last few weeks we've had a montage of Scriptures. We've had Scriptures from all over the Bible uh, and that we've read from. This morning we're just going to read straight out of Matthew chapter 24, and uh, we're going to read these, these few verses starting with verse 3. And following. So let's read these together this morning. The Bible says, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved, and the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Let's pray. Father, we need you right now. Oh, how we need you now. I pray, God, right now that you just open our hearts to the truth that's contained within these pages the truth that's uh, revealed through your word. I pray that we'd be open to what the Holy Spirit is trying to do in our lives. And Father, as we go through these next few moments, I pray, Father, right now that we do everything that you have asked us to do, that we communicate clearly and effectively. God, that you would just prevent anything that the enemy would try to do to, to eliminate divine communication today uh, from here to our ears and to our hearts. And God, we pray at the end of this time, that if there's somebody in here that's never made a decision to follow you, that today would be a day, God, uh, like never before. That today would be a day of salvation for somebody. That somebody who's maybe, they've wandered far, far away, that would, day to, would be a day that they would come back home with the confidence and the assurance that you love us so much that you're willing to forgive, you're willing to love, you're willing to do exactly what the word says you will do. So, uh, Father, do everything that you're capable of, of doing and help us to be courageous and obedient in this time together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And you can be seated. You know, we know that we are here at the end of times. We, we we've re think everybody in the room is, is convinced. I even read a statistic this past week where 40% of non-believers, 40% of non-believers believe that we are living in the end of times. And so as you hear that, as a follower of Christ, we, we're certain that one day Jesus is going to come back. He's going to come back and get his church. We know that the Bible says and makes it very clear. We're not here to put dates on this. The Bible says no man knows the time nor the hour. Nobody knows. Even though we're seeing these signs and even though these things prophetically are happening, nobody knows. And so what do we do while we're waiting on Jesus? Well, you've heard this message You've known it all your life. Maybe it's just uh, come to the forefront of your mind because of the reality of what's happening in the world uh, currently. But the first thing you want to do, if, if you're saying, okay, we know Jesus has come back. We know we're in the final countdown. What have I got to do? Listen, the first thing you got to do is be ready. Very simple this morning. you got to be ready. When you start looking at what, be ready for what, Pastor John? you got to be ready for his return because it's coming. It's coming. And, and we live in a world right now, the Bible says that it's going to catch this world asleep. It's going to come like a thief to so many because they never saw it coming. I wasn't ready. I need more time. 
I don't have these things done in my life yet. I, there's going to be all kinds of excuses for those who are not ready. I shared with you last week in the book of Daniel, the Bible says that the wicked are not going to understand this, but the wise will. The wise are going to understand. They're going to sense the end of times. They're going to sense what God's doing and what we're seeing. You know, yesterday we had dinner with another pastor last night, one and I did, with he and his family. And he said, man, y'all are baptizing people every week. You're doing great things. You're seeing people get saved. People come to Christ. And you know, I said, you know why? Because the Lord has promised at the end there's going to be an outpouring of his spirit. He's going to pour his spirit out on all flesh, your sons and your daughters. He's going to do these things. And I just believe that we're seeing some of this stuff happen right before our eyes. But there's something that you've got to take hold of this morning. You've got to embrace whether you want to or not. When we talk about being ready, Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 3, it'll be on the screen. John chapter 3, verse 3, listen to this. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God unless one is born again. And here's this question. What does it mean to be born again? Because we live in a world right now that's just so far from the word of God. We think that, we think that the lifestyle that we live now and what culture says it means to be a Christian and what culture does and how people say that we're supposed to talk and dress and act, what we think church is supposed to be and what it's not. We have such a divided world today on, on, on this word. You got all these denominations, you got all these different theologies, you got all these different gospels. You say, Pastor, we don't have a different gospel. The Bible talks about the gospels. No, every one of us in the room have our own gospel. Whether you want to believe it or not, you do. There's certain things you're going to believe, certain things you're not going to believe. Certain things you're going to say, well, that went away. That went away when the apostles died. Or this is supposed to be this way now. Everybody in the room has their own gospel. But here's what matters. You must be born again. When Jesus was talking to this with Nicodemus, man, he was... He said this. He was not referring to any kind of literal or physical rebirth. I mean, he used the term reborn and, and to affirm our need as individuals to be redeemed or spiritually transformed and refashioned and maybe even possibly remade uh, through God's saving grace and eventually his death on the cross. And so when he began to explain this to Nicodemus, Jesus connected his mission on the earth to the Old Testament story that Nicodemus should have been very much aware with, right? He was one of the smartest people. The Bible says he was like the dude, right? He's like, this is the dude everybody goes to. If you want to know anything about the law, you go to Nicodemus, right? But then Nicodemus is saying, what in the world are you talking about? Well, if you want to answer a biblical question, you just get it from the Bible, right? You get a question about the Bible, where do you want to answer it from? You want to answer it from the Bible. And so what does Jesus do? He goes back to an old statement. He tells us in Numbers chapter 21, this is John chapter 3, but he says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, Jesus said, Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life, right? But what in the world was Jesus talking about? Even as Moses lifted up the serpent. And so you'd have to go back to Numbers chapter 21 to read all this, but he, there was a plague of fiery serpents, right? I would not have worked out so well in this, right, because I hate snakes. The minute those snakes got loose on the ground, I'm out, right? You ain't got to worry about me getting bit. I'm running. No, no desire for snakes. I say this all the time. There's two kinds of snakes, a chicken snake and a rattlesnake, and if there's not a chicken in its mouth, it's a rattlesnake, right? And I'm for killing them all. That's just my opinion. Sorry for all the snake lovers in the, in the house. We do not handle snakes in here either, by the way, right? Make sure that's clear. Don't bring one. You will be asked to leave. Um, but is this, this plague that the children of Israel were constantly complaining. They were constantly complaining about what, what they didn't have, what they, what they wished they had, where, where they wished they could be. And they were, they were reaching and striving for things that just wasn't part of God's plan. Amen. Does that sound familiar to you and I today? Are we constantly complaining, constantly reaching, constantly desiring things that's really not even remotely close to what God's will is for our life? But we want them anyway. And so get, get, because of what happened, dude, he sent a plague of fiery serpents and started biting everybody. And to save those who were bitten, Moses was instructed by God to create a bronze serpent on a flagpole and put it out in the camp, right? So he stands up a, a flagpole, if you will, and it's got an arm. It goes up, and it looks much like the cross. It goes up, but there is a snake 
a bronze snake that's round around this flagpole. Go back to Numbers 21 and read this. And, and he, as he puts the snake up on there, everybody in the camp, everybody who looked upon the bronze serpent would be miraculously healed from the poison that was, was running through their veins. That doesn't make any sense, Pastor. Why in the world would God tell Moses to put a snake on a pole and look at him? The point of the comparison that Jesus was making to Nicodemus was this. You know, at our core, at our core, every one of us in the room, at our core, man, we are corrupted by poison. You know what that poison is? Dude, that poison is sin. And it has corrupted so many people. You know, one of the guys, he just lives right up here. He wrote a, wrote a song. Harold McCorder wrote a song years ago. It's amazing, you know, that people right here in Harrison County can write something and get famous, right? But he wrote this song. So every time you hear this, this, this quote I'm about to make, every time you hear it anywhere about any other pastor, it was written by a dude who lives at the end of our parking lot right here, right? Harold McCorder. Sin will take you further than you ever meant to go. It'll keep you there longer than you ever meant to stay. And it'll cost you more than you ever meant to pay. That's poison. You know, and, and when you think about that poison that's running through your veins, some of you are going back to like the 80s rock area, right, or 90s maybe. And you're thinking about poison running through my veins, venomous poison. You need to think about the sin in your life because it's venomous poison. It's running through your veins. It's killing you. And it separates you and I from God. And I, I want to say this to you, man. The point of that comparison was to show Nicodemus that there's a deadly poison of personal sin. And as the apostle writes this, all have sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, unfortunately, the consequences of this sin is spiritual death. That's what it is. It's a spiritual death. It's eternal separation from God. But here's the beauty. Just as God provided a way for the Israelites to get out, look at the serpent and you can be healed. God loves us so much that he gave us a, a person that we can look at and we can be healed, right? The problem is too often, it's not really a look, it's a glance. Too often we don't look, look to Jesus for salvation. We just look at him to get us out of the situation we're in. And unfortunately, I mean, Jesus was raised on a cross to be our saving grace. And, and I love this in Romans Paul writes in Romans 5, 8, he said, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. And here's, we, we, we don't argue because of his great love for us who is rich in mercy. He made us alive. This is Ephesians 2, 4. He made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It's by grace we've been saved. You know, God don't have to do it, but he does. He didn't have to make a way for the people who were disobedient in the, in the wilderness. He didn't have to make a way for us, but he did. And he does. The problem is we're living in the final times. We're in the end of times. Things are coming together at a rapid pace. Nobody's paying attention to what's really going on in the world today. And then what's going to happen is we're going to be caught off guard. And it's the same concept for some of you like, man, I've never heard of the BRICS nation. Man, man, I've, I've never heard of the SDG. Man, I've never even heard of the, somebody said, I ain't never even heard of the UN. Really? you never heard of the United Nations? My goodness. Lord have mercy. Where are we? And listen. So many people are going to be saying the same thing. I didn't know Jesus was coming back today. I'd have been ready if I knew it. But here's, here's, here's the thing, man. Here's the truth. You don't know. You don't know when he's coming back. So you better be ready. You, you better be ready. Jesus made it clear to enter the kingdom of God and experience true transformation, forgiveness, and healing. I mean, total renewal and regeneration are required. And, and again, here's the deal. The poison of sin is too great for you to overcome by yourself. You can't do it. You cannot do it. How many times have you said, hey, I'm just going to do it this last time. This is going to be the last time I want to do this. This is the last time I'm going to watch porn. This is the last time I'm going to have premarital sex. This is the last time I'm going to do all these things. I'm not going to do them anymore. Last time I'm going to drink it. Last time I'm going to smoke it. The last time I'm going to shoot it up. It's the last time and I will get my life right, right? I won't do it anymore. And you did great for a little while. But isn't it crazy how after just a short time it comes back around, there's the temptation again. And boom. And, and, and we just we just weren't ready. 
We just weren't ready. In response to Nicodemus's confusion about being born again, he goes and tells him, he said, unless someone is born of water and the spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. That which has been born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Here's what happens. You know, in my book, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a book, hope to be done with it by the end of the year and get this thing published and get moving on. But here, here's the deal. I've entitled it, I've prayed the prayer. That's the title of the book, I've prayed the prayer. And here's where we really are, if I can just be transparent and honest with you. So many people have been talked into just praying a prayer. Just praying a prayer. Just come down, hey, just repeat after me. Hey, do you, you know, we, we preach hellfire brimstone, right? We, we, and I say this, and again, uh, I make no apologies for it, but I'm not that preacher that's going to try to scare the hell out of you so you'll come down and get saved. I'm the dude that wants you to understand being saved is not about missing hell. Being saved is about knowing there was a man up there named Jesus Christ who died for you and who died for me, who loves you unconditionally. It's not about missing hell. You will miss hell if you fall in love with him. You don't have nothing to worry about, but it's not about, hey, I got to go get right with Jesus because I don't want to go to hell. You need to get right with Jesus because he loves you, gave his life for you, wants to have a relationship with you. And everything he did, he paid it all, and all to him you owe. But that's not the mentality in the church world today. It's not our culture. It's not our culture. Paul writes in his letter to the Galatians, I've been crucified with Christ. Man, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Hey, why do you do what you do, John Ellis? Why are you over here in the schools and in the jail? Why are you mentoring? Why are you making disciples? Why? Listen, because I know what he's done for me. And I'm crucifying this flesh. It's no longer John who's living, but it's the Spirit of God. It's Jesus Christ who's living in me. Things change when you get born again. Charles Spurgeon said this. No transformation. No salvation. No transformation. No salvation. Dude, I love you, man. I love you. I love everybody here. But I owe it to you to tell you the truth. Man, if you came down and you prayed a prayer one time because a preacher said this, I'm just telling you what happens. What happened to me is what happened to so many. You come down, you pray a prayer, and because, listen, I can't speak to every denomination. I certainly speak to, to one in particular. But this is what happens. They come down, and they're so excited because they've not had anybody saved in 100 years because they're not making disciples. They're not doing outreach. They're not mentoring. Nothing in the church is growing. Somebody gets saved, right? They're so excited. They put a King James Bible in their hand, pat them on the back, say, hey, write that down so we can send that in to the denomination that we had somebody get saved and they give them that Bible and they say good luck good luck and we've left our young people to figure it out on their own man so many so many I mean really we, we've only got I can I, I see some man you're some of you dads in here you're killing it you're killing it man you're making disciples out of your your kids you're doing it you're doing it and doing it but listen to me dad some of you ain't I love you, but some of you ain't. You're wondering why your kids are where they are because you ain't been influenced in their life. I'm just, I'm just telling you. Can they still turn out bad when you are the influence? Yeah, absolutely. I had a great influence. I turned out pretty bad. <laughs> did my mama amen in the back? Thank you. I figured she did. I looked back there and saw her. I said, you know, I shouldn't have said that. My mom and dad's in the house this morning. I shouldn't have said that. Help me, Lord. Can you strike that from the broadcast? Thank you. So we, we look at this and we, we forget that Paul, Paul laid out this. He said, knowing that our old self was crucified with Christ in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that would no longer, we would no longer be slaves to sin for the one who has died has freed us from sin. Man, he's not come to give you a, I hear this all the time, Blake says it, Johnny says it all the time. He's not come just to give you a get out of the situation card or get out of hell free card. That's not what he's come he has come so that you would kill that old man. The old man needs to die so the new can come and grow and be everything that it's supposed to be. That's what we're supposed to do, and we're not willing to die to that. Man, I still love doing this. I still love being this person, man. Listen, you got to get ready because Jesus ain't coming for that person. You know, the kids laughed the other day. I shared with them this story. I said, you know, we did a little proposal, right? And I, I was like... Hey, I'll marry you. I gave a little scenario. It's like, hey, I asked my wife to marry me, right? I asked one. We've been married 
28 years. We've been together since we've been 14, right? That's been a minute. But can you imagine if when I asked her, I said, why don't you marry me? And she said this. She said, you know, John, um, you know I love you, right? But, you know, I had some good times with, with Johnny. And, you know, I, 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 I want to marry you, but, look, I, I would really like to hang out with Johnny at least five weeks out of the, out of the year. I'd like to hang out with him about five weeks. And, woo, there was old Mike, too, right? There was... I, you know, he, man, he was so good. We were like attached at the hip in high school. And, and you know, I, I know I want five weeks with Johnny, but I also like to have five weeks with Mike. And, 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 you know, then there was this, if you'll just let me have the 10 or 12 weeks with these people, you'll be my favorite, John. And if you'll let me do that, I'll marry you. Who in the world is going to do that? It's like, you, you will marry me if I will let you do the things you want to do live in the sin you want to live in, live a life that you want to live, and you want me to marry you. Listen to me. Jesus is not coming back for that bride. He's not coming back for that church. That's what's scary. And when you read Matthew chapter 7, you'll see when he says that difficult is the way, broad is the way that leads to destruction, but he says narrow is the way that leads to righteousness. It's a difficult way, and only a few people find it. Listen to me. Few ain't everybody. A few's not everybody. Everybody's not getting in. Just because you prayed a prayer doesn't mean you're going. There's more to it than that. I hope this morning that you understand you've got to be a follower of Christ. You've got to be a follower of Christ. You know, somebody gave me a little static the other day about that. said, you put a lot of emphasis on being a disciple. You put a lot of emphasis on, on, on being a follower of Christ. You put a lot on there. And I, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly if I agree with your theology, but you put a lot on it. I said, well, dude, what else did he tell us to do? He told us to go you therefore and make disciples. So that should be a high priority in your life. And, and furthermore, this, you, you believe in God. Read the book of James. You believe in God. You do well. You do well. But listen to what he says. The pastor of the church at Jerusalem. This is what he says. Jesus, half brother. Listen to what he says. You believe in God, you do well. But even the demons believe. What in the world is going to keep now? If God so loved the world that whosoever shall call on his name shall be saved. If all you have to do is believe and call on the name of the Lord and be saved, why are these demons who believe in God, why are they not going to get in? Why, why are they not going to make it in? Can I tell you why? There's one thing that separates them from a born again believer. It's a word called obedience. It's great to read John 3, 16, but go on down there and read the rest of the chapter. Go on and read what it says about those who don't obey the gospel. Just go on and finish the reading. Don't just pick a verse. Remember I said you got your own gospel? Pick a verse. Hey, I prayed the prayer. God didn't come into the world to condemn the world. He came into the world might be saved. That's me, and I prayed the prayer, and I'm good. I don't follow him. I don't, go, I don't have nothing to do with him. don't want to know anything about him. But I prayed that prayer. Friend, you're lost. You're lost. If there's no transformation... There's no salvation. And we're in the final countdown. You got to be ready. I got to move on. The next thing you got to do is number two is you got to be looking. You got to be looking. Say, Pastor, what do you mean looking for what? You got to be looking for Jesus. Look at what your look at what your Bible says. Matthew 24, verse 43. It says, Know this that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and he would not have let his house be broken into. All this sermon series, this entire sermon series, we've been saying these verses, stay awake, stay awake, stay alert. You've got to be looking. Why is it important to be looking? Look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10. It says this, the, Lord of the, day is going to, the, Lord, the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens are going to pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved in the earth, and the works that are done will all be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Waiting for and hastening for. That hastening's a big word. Looking for. Eagerly longing, longing for the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Man, how many of you in here just like to have some peace? Amen. Can I tell you where it comes from? Can I tell you where it comes from? They call him Jehovah Shalom all through the Bible. He's the God of peace. 
Jesus, the God of peace. And count the patience of our Lord for salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them in these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. Verse 17, you with the area of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Listen to me in this, in this moment. You know, when, when, when we talk about looking, when we talk about waiting for Jesus, and we're talking about looking, looking for Jesus, what, what does that entail? What, what does that entail? Does that entail a, a Sunday morning? That's a Sunday morning thing, right? We get up and go to church Sunday morning. On Sunday morning, we're going to be looking for Jesus. On this particular day, this is Wednesday night, we're going to be looking for Jesus. At a certain church meeting, we're going to be looking for Jesus. I said this years ago, and I borrowed this from somebody else. It broke my heart one day, and it just changed my life. It'll change yours if you'll let it. L listen to this statement. I got this from Johnny Hunt years ago. This is what he said. Who you are when you're all alone, that's who you are. Who you are when you're all alone, that's who you are. You know, it's easy, like Jason said in worship this morning. Man, it's easy to be looking for Jesus with hands raised, great music, people worshiping around you and fellow believers. But what do you do when you're suffering? What do you do when everything's going great? When there's no reason to be looking for Jesus? What are we looking for when it's just us in the room late at night all by ourselves? What are we looking for? Are we looking for the return of Jesus? Because too often their answers were not. And I'll show you in just a minute what the Bible says about looking for Jesus. Even though it says no man knows the time nor the hour when the Son of Man comes or will be coming, every morning you can be looking. Every day you can be looking. Every day you can be expecting. And I'm just telling you, if we knew what day the thief was going to come, would you not be ready? In one of the sermons, we used the parable of the ten virgins. Here's what I want you to hear. Go back and read the parable of the ten virgins. Here's what you're going to see. All ten of them had a lamp. That's so significant. So significant. I'm not here to get into a bunch of doc doctrinal controversies in any capacity, but I want you to hear me. All ten of them did something to get a lamp. What was that something? I personally believe that they did something through their belief or they had proved something as a disciple, as a follower, that they deserved a lamp. Could that possibly be that you come down and somebody came down and prayed a prayer and they said, Lord, I want you and nothing else. I want to surrender my heart to you. And he said, okay, listen, we give them a King James Bible or we give them a Bible or whatever we give them. Certificate, whatever we give them, right? He gave him a lamp. And this is what he said. Keep your lamps trim and burning because you don't know when I'm coming back. Keep in mind, they all had a lamp. But when he came back, all of them that had a lamp didn't get to go. Why did they not get to go? Because, listen, they weren't ready. They weren't, not only were they not ready, they weren't looking. They weren't expecting today can be the day. You know, my, my dad's here, and uh, I'll just tell you, he's mailed out in his old age, right? True story, he mailed out in his old age. I got to stay on time right here. He's mailed out, mailed out in his old age. Man, he used to be, in my, when I was young, back when I was a kid, tell some story, but it's what I knew. He's sitting back there, and I'm still scared of him, right? He's 71 or two years old, and I'm still scared of him. All right? There's a reason for that. Because when he told me he was going to do something, he did it. When he told me he was going to do something, he did it. This is what he say. I'm going to run to the store and back. When I get back, that room better be clean. First time, I didn't think he meant what he said. <laughs> First time, I didn't think he was 
I thought he might have just been joking around with me, right? But when he got back, the joke was over. I don't know if you see anybody get their belt off fast as he can. He can get it off fast, right? What part do you not understand, son? I told you to do this. By the time I got back, that room better be clean. Yes, sir. We did good for a while, right? Dad, when are you coming back? <laughs> what time? You, how much time I got? I'll be back at 3.30. All right, all right. Well, you know, at 3.20, we're scrambling. We're cleaning it up. We're doing whatever we got to do, right? We push it to the max. It's just human nature. But because he did what he said he was going to do, he didn't have no problem when I didn't obey him because he loves me. He chastens me. Man, that's exactly what the Bible says. And because he said, hey, this is the consequences if you do this. This is what's going to happen. And because those consequences happened, I knew that when he spoke, it meant business, right? So when he said, let's do this, then we got it done. Most of the time, we got it done, right? What do you think is going to happen with Jesus? He is going to do exactly what he says he's going to do. And although those ten virgins all got a lamp, they weren't prepared. They weren't looking. And when he came, guess what he did? Exactly what he said he was going to do. And they were trying to get in and trying to get in with somebody. Give us some of your oil. Give us some of this. Give us some of your salvation. Give us some of your spirit. Give us some of what you got so that we can get in. It was too late. It's too late. They didn't get in. They beat on the door. Let us in. Let us in. It's too late. It's too late. But I had a lamp. You gave me a lamp, Jesus. I was a disciple. You gave me a lamp. I had a lamp. Yeah, but you didn't do what you were supposed to do with it. It was your responsibility to make sure it was full. It was your responsibility to take care of it. It was your responsibility. You chose not to be responsible with what I gave you. That's why, you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer talked about cheap grace. Grace is not cheap. It costs our Savior his life, but to some of us, it's cheap. It's cheap because we don't honor it. We don't appreciate what it's really here to do. If we did, our lives would be different. Our lives would be different. If you knew what time he was coming, dude, you'd be ready. If I know my daddy's coming back home after he told me to do something, I'm going to be ready, and it's going to be done. He don't even live with me right now, but if he told me something, when I get over to your house, I'll like, yes, sir. I'd say, I want to get busy. <laughs> Just kidding. Let's get busy. Here come. Daddy's coming. Daddy's coming. Third thing I want you to see this morning, if, if, as we get in this final countdown, listen, this is going to get a lot of us right here. Listen, you need to be serving. You need to be serving Jesus. If you love him, you need to be serving him. You need to be serving him. You say, well, pastor, that's not really important. Oh, it's very important. It's very important. And I, can't, I don't have time to go through this whole thing. I've already gone through this in the sermon series. But we're living in times when people are only interested in what God can do for them, not what they can do for the kingdom of God. Amen. It's not about what can I do for the kingdom of God. It's what can the kingdom of God do for me? What can the church do for me? I just want to remind you, I'm not going to read the whole thing, so don't worry about that in the back. But if you were to go back and you were to read the parable of the talents, and you were to see it was like a man going on a journey who called his servants together, and they entrusted him. He entrusted them with his property. What has Jesus entrusted us with? Man, he's entrusted us with our kids. He's entrusted us with our church. He's entrusted us with the community. He's entrusted us to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be the voice of Jesus. He's entrusted us with these things that are his property. He gave five talents to one, two to another, one to another. And then he left. Then he left. And here's the reality. He's coming back. Every one of these things, every one of these parables are pointing to we've got a responsibility as followers of Christ, and Jesus is coming back. And, and this is so crazy in this passage. The first guy took his five, turned it into ten. The second one doubled his. But when he got back to the, the, the last dude, he come back and he said, Hey, uh, Jesus, here's my one you gave me. Gave it to him. Here's my one. He's like, Dude. What's up with that? And he's like, you, you gave me your one, and I knew. This is, this is what I knew. He said, I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, here, have what is yours. But his master answered him. You know what he called him? He called him wicked. Wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I've not sown and gather where I've no scattered no seed. You ought to have at least invested the money with interest. 
Then he said, take the talent and give it to the other dude, right? So we know that story. I want you to think about it. He didn't do anything sexually immoral with his talent. He didn't gamble it, pocket the money. He didn't do anything in here that would be what we would see as sinful. In our culture today, this dude didn't do anything. He took what Jesus gave him. He took the talent and he buried it in the ground. Didn't do anything with it. Just didn't do anything with it. Just left it in the ground. That's it. Pastor, what's so bad about that? I don't know. You have to take that up with Jesus. Here's what you're also going to have to take up with him. What did he give you that you've not done anything with? Some of you by now ought to be teachers, but you're still drinking out of a bottle. Some of you by now should be leading disciple groups, growth groups. Some of you by now should know more than the scripture Jesus wept. And some of you do. And some of you are making disciples. And some of you are doing an incredible job. But when you look at the world today, why are we where we at? Why are we not seeing great revivals? Why are we not having an outpouring of the Spirit? I told this to Dan this week. You know what? I'm sick and tired of reminiscing. My goodness, I am sick and tired of reminiscing. He said, what, what do you mean? I'm tired of talking about what God did back in the old days. I'm tired of talking about what he did at Salem when we started with 12 people. I'm tired of talking about what happened when, when we were a kid. The outpouring at Azusa Street, the outpouring at the Revival, these outpourings at other places. I'm tired of reminiscing. You know that the same God that did all those things is the same one we're reading about right here in the Bible? It's the same one who wants to pour his Holy Spirit out on everybody? But listen, all the church wants to do is reminisce. Man, it sure is good to have those memories. We sing about them, precious memories, how they linger, how they ever flood my soul. The problem is we're not making any new ones. We're not making any new ones because we're not serving. And I'm telling you, what's God, when he comes back, you're going to have to give an account. When he comes back, you're going to have to give an account for what you did with what he gave you. Dude, think about this. What is the greatest gift that every one of us in this room got? Salvation. And it's not good enough for you to share with somebody else. It's not good enough for you to... Get over your fears. Get past your hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Work through your brokenness. You're just going to stay broken all your life? Man, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. And I don't mean no disrespect. You're telling me a God who heals, a God who saves, a God who's going to allow you to walk on the streets of gold, walls of jasper, going to create a new heaven and a new earth, going to be a place with no sickness, no pain, no cancer, no hurt, no habits, no hang-ups, none of those things. We're going to just stay broken all of our lives because we don't want to deal with it. That's a big P-R-I-D-E word. That's a whole nother sermon. But I'm just saying pride cometh before the fall. So all those things that keep tripping you up, keep tripping your family up, keep tripping everything up about you, that's on you, bro. That's on you. That's on you. He's got enough grace and got enough mercy and got enough love. And here's the problem. If you come to me for counseling, I'm going I'm to ask you this. I love you, but I'm going to ask you this because this is the problem. Are you making disciples? Pastor John, I need help. Are you making disciples? You know, it's crazy what happens when you get the focus off of yourself and on somebody else. It's crazy what happens when, when all of a sudden I'm not thinking about John Ellis anymore. I'm thinking about what can we do in the high school? What can we do in the jails? What can we do in the plants? What can we do in the businesses? Where can we sit down at Jack's and make disciples? Who can come to our office and make disciples? When you get the focus off you and it's on somebody else and you're giving them the word of God, I'm telling you, everything in your life changes. You ought to try it one time. Everything changes. You don't think about what you don't have. You think about what you're giving this person. The greatest message of all time. The greatest love. There's no love that compares to the love of God. You're giving that to them. You don't think about what you don't have anymore. You don't walk around complaining anymore. You just trust God. But when you look and say, hey, are you making disciples? No, Pastor John. I'm not making disciples. Last point, we're done. You got to be excited for his return. Pastor John, you've been telling me I got to be all these things. I'm just telling you, you got to be excited for his return. Well, if he comes back tomorrow, he's going to mess up my plans. Well, you need to make sure you and your family know Jesus because if he comes back tomorrow, I'm just, I love you. I'm telling you the truth, right? Telling you the truth. You may be saved, Dad. You may be saved, Mom. All right, but your husband may not be. Your kids may not be. But here's the deal just because your kid's not saved, that's not going to stop Jesus from coming back. It's just not. He has entrusted us. 
He has entrusted. Paul told Timothy, man, do what you've been told to do, what we've entrusted you to do. Do it. What has he entrusted us to do? Man, he's entrusted you to make sure your family knows Jesus. You know, what's crazy is most husbands and wives in, the, in today's world, they can't tell me their, their husband or their wives or their spouses or their kids' conversion experience. I've had in funerals. I had to do funerals. And I had to, I've had to ask a husband or a wife, were they born again? And it's what they say. I don't know. Dude, y'all been married 48 years. And that conversation never came up. That's a true story. Y'all been married that long, and that conversation never came up. Dude, I'm just telling you from my seat, what does that tell me as a pastor about, oh, I love Jesus. I love Jesus so much, I never asked my wife if she was going to bust tail wide open when she died. I love my Jesus so much that I, I loved him so much that I didn't have the courage to, to talk to my husband and just tell me, when did you accept Jesus? When were you truly born again? I love Jesus so much and I love my family so much that I didn't have the courage to say, hey, husband, hey, wife. Um, Jesus said, I, I know we've been married a long time, and Jesus says, I will know you by the fruit you bear, but, dude, I've never seen any fruit. I'm not trying to be inspecting your fruit right here, but, dude, I just need to know, is thy heart right with God? Because it's appointed unto man wants to die, and after that, you're going to stand in judgment. Dude, do, do you know him? We've got to be excited for his return. It's not a time to be living in fear or with fear. It's time to be excited and anxiously awaiting Jesus' return. Man, when we started preaching about the final countdown, that first couple of messages, it freaked some of y'all out. It freaked some of you out. It's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me that these things are in motion? These things are going to happen? All these people throwing these data. I'm not a date. I keep, nobody can legitimately give a date and say, Jesus, come back on the 23rd of September. Nobody can do that. But what you can do is look at the signs and look at what the prophecies say, and you can, you can start digging out God's word, and you can be looking for him, and you can be excited. It didn't, it didn't scare me. It didn't scare me. It doesn't give me any fear at all. You know why? Because I'm going to get to see him face to face, dude. Who cannot be excited about seeing the king of glory face to face? It's like, man, I, I'm afraid if he comes by, it's going to mess up my pants. Yeah, but you're going to get to see the dude we've been preaching about your whole life. The one in this book, the one we've been reading about, you're going to get to look at him for the first time. Man, I can't think of anything else to be more excited about. I ought to give all of us a running spell in here this morning to think about seeing him for the first time. Some of you like Thomas. I ain't going to believe unless I can see him. Well, you're going to see him. But bless God, you better be ready when you do. Because every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. He's the man. He's, he's Lord. But listen, listen to this. It's got to be a time of excited excitement for his return. I love this, Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. I love this, man. Not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Listen to me. He's not coming back tied to no whipping post. He's not coming back going to get no whipping with no cat of nine tails. He's not coming back spit upon and mocked on. He's coming back as the king of glory, and he's coming to get those people who are eagerly waiting for him. That's who he's coming back to get. Those who are excited. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. If you want him to come, you get things in gear. You get your priorities in gear. You get your, you, you get your, your theology in gear. And if you're excited about him coming and you know your children and your family, your husband and your wife are not where they need to be, dude, who in the world? What is that, Pendulette? Is that right, Blake? Pendulette? Pendulette, we showed this year. He's, he's a, a world renowned, a world -renowned um, atheist. And he had a dude come up and try to proselytize him one night at a show, right? And he did a YouTube video. He was so excited. He didn't have to do it. He got millions, millions of views. This world-renowned atheist, he, he puts a show, and he said, listen, this dude comes up and proselytizes me after a show. No, and I said, dude, I'm, I'm not going to turn to Jesus. But then he goes back and he shoots. God, listen, what the enemy meant for evil, God turned it to good. I'm just telling you. Over a million people got to hear him say, dude, if I really believed in something, even though I don't, it's what he said, I don't believe in this Jesus thing. But if I really did... And I really thought people would go to a place of torment and they would live the rest of their life, all eternity, in a place of torment. If I really believed that, I'd be doing a lot of proselytizing. I'd be telling people about Jesus if I really believed it. 
All of that from a world-renowned atheist. You can go on YouTube and look him up. You can look that same show up, exactly what, what he said. And so the thing about it is, for us who are eagerly waiting, man, we're excited. H how can you not be excited when you know Romans 8, 28? We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, how can you not? Be excited to know that your God is for you. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation? No. Distress? No. Persecution? No. Famine? Nakedness? Danger or sword? As it's written, for your sake we're being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep being led to slaughter. Knowing all these things, we're more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Jesus Christ our Lord. How in the world can you not be excited about that kind of love? How can we not live for that kind of love? God has always been for us. Musicians, if you'll make your way. God has always been for us. I want to show you this real quickly. I want to show you this while the musicians are coming up. God has always been for us. He's always been for those, those who love him, those who serve him. But in 2 Kings chapter 6, I don't know if you remember this story or not, but once the king of Syria was warring against Israel and he took counsel with his servants, and he was saying, At such and such place shall the enemy shall be at my camp. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are going down there. King of Israel sent to his place about which the man of God told him. Thus he used to warn him, so that he saved himself there more than once or twice. And the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this thing, and he called his servant and said to them, Will you not show me who this is that's for the king? You know what's happening? He thinks, the king thinks somebody's leaking information. Somebody in our camp is passing on information to the people we're going to fight. They're getting information where we're going to be, and when we get there, they're not there. One of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who's in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that, listen, that you speak in your bedroom. I love that. And he said, Go and see where he is, and I may send and seize him. It was told, Behold, he's in Dothan. So he sent their horses and chariots and the great army, and they came by night and surrounded the city. This is what I'm praying for us right here in this moment. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots were all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Let's pause right here for just a second. They're looking for Elisha. The plan is to come and seize him. And the next morning, when the servant wakes up, he goes out on the porch, cup of coffee in hand, right? And when he gets out there, he looks, and all the way around them, they're, they're encamped. They're surrounded. And it's inevitable that there's no way out of the situation. You know, and the reality of it is, there's some of us in here in this morning, somebody watching online, maybe you're in a situation with your, with your faith. Maybe, maybe it could be a different situation, but you're saying, man, I, there's no way at this age that I can, I can get right with Jesus. It'll be so embarrassing. There's no way that it, at this time, I and mean, I've been going to Sunday school, I've been teaching Sunday school, I've been preaching, I've been doing all these things, but there's, there's just no way I could just really come clean. There's no way out of this situation. And you say, Pastor John, nobody thinks that, nobody does those kind of things, but listen to me, they do. A few weeks ago, we had a 75-year-old Nana in here get born again in the service, right? She said she came down to pray to prayer at 25. She knew for 50 years that she was lost and on her way to hell. She knew that, and she never responded because of pride. She was afraid of what her family would think. She was afraid of what her friends would think. She was afraid of what her kids would say about it. Mom, you, you, how can you not be saved? So she said, I live with it. 75 years old. Gives her heart to Jesus. We got to baptize her a few weeks ago. Listen to me. You'll find yourself in a situation where you're totally surrounded by the thoughts in your mind. There's no way out. There's no way I can get out of this. There's no way I can come clean. There's no way that I can beat this. There's just no way out. And it feels like you're surrounded by so many things, dude. And that's just where we are in this world today. We're surrounded by so many things. But listen to me. Elijah started praying. He said this in verse 16. He said, do not be afraid for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I don't see nobody. 
All I see is the enemy. The enemy is totally around me. I don't, I don't see anybody. What are you talking about, Elisha? What are you talking about? And this is what I'm praying for us this morning. The same thing that Elisha prayed. He said, oh, Lord, please, please open his eyes. Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. And the Bible says, so the Lord opened his eyes. And it was in that moment when he looked up, I love this, when he looked up, he, he prayed and he opened his eyes. And the mountains, I love this, the mountains were full, the Bible says, full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. The Bible says that when the Syrians came down against him, Elijah prayed to, the, prayed to the Lord, please strike this people with blindness, and God struck them with blindness, and he just led them out of the way. What would it look like for you this morning if your eyes were open? It's the final countdown. We're coming down to the, the end of times, man. I don't know how long he's going to tell you it's coming, but here's what needs to happen. You need to be ready. You need to be looking for him. You need to be serving, man. And if, listen, if you're looking... If you're, if you're ready and you're looking and you're serving, how can you not be excited? How can you not be excited that in just a moment Carson's going to get in the, in the, in the tank and, and we're going we're gonna to get to baptize another brother? Dying and raised to life. How can that not? Listen, out of everything that happens in the world, everything that happens in the spiritual realm, the only thing that gets all of heaven rejoices is when one, one sinner repents, truly gets born again. The Bible says all of heaven is rejoicing. All of heaven is rejoicing. So as it comes down for you this morning, maybe you feel like you can't get out of this. Maybe you feel like there's just no way. So as we pray right here, I'm going to pray that your eyes are open. I'm going to pray that you see the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You see the God that saved Noah, and you see the God who promises that he'll save you if you're serious about a relationship with him. And today, ladies and gentlemen, t t today can be a day of salvation for somebody in the room. Today can be a day when that marriage is restored. Today can be a day when your brokenness is finally not controlling you anymore. That your depression is not controlling you anymore. That that unforgiveness that you have for a father or mother or that it's not controlling you anymore. Today can be that day. So as we pray, man, I'm just believing God's going to open somebody's eyes and you're going to see where you really are, where you really are, and that you'll run to the Father. You'll run to the Father, man. You know, the prodigal son would never have been in the Bible. It had never been in the Bible if there would not have been or would never be an opportunity for that to become applicable in our lives. Can I ask you again, man, how long are you going to live in that pig pen? How long is it going to take before you come to your senses and just realize, I can't do this. I can't do this. you got to stop drinking the poison and expecting somebody else to die. You can't do this. You need to get to Jesus. Get to him while you have time. Get to him while you have time. If you're not happy with him, Satan will take you right back. He'll take you right back. But why don't you give Jesus an opportunity? I promise you he'll make a difference. I promise you he will. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We know with the crowd this large that there's somebody in here who certainly is bound. And God, today, I pray today be a day of freedom. That today would be a day that as we embrace you,
Our salvation is nearer and closer than it's ever been. But today needs to be a day of salvation for somebody. Today needs to be a day where we transform the way of thinking. We need to renew our minds and we need to stop compromising. Man, there was a time in our life when we were so concerned about holiness and so concerned about purity and so concerned about just living for Jesus. And, and then all of a sudden, things transpired in our lives. Things grew in our lives. Doors were open. And the next thing you know, holiness is not a big deal anymore. And we began to compromise our relationship with you. And somebody in the room right now is wondering, Lord, will you really take me back? Can I get back to that point in my life? Holy Spirit, would you just give them the assurance right now? Your word says that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us. There are so many people here today that would love to pray with anyone who's struggling in these areas. But nobody can do what you do, Jesus. Nobody can do what you do, Holy Spirit. So do what only you're capable of in this moment. And help, hear, help us to hear really well, to be discerning in this time of invitation. And have a confidence, God, that you are an on-time God every time, that you will deliver. Thank you for this day and for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Some have responded, but what about you? What's the Holy Spirit saying to you? Would you stand to your feet? I know we've got an exciting time with Carson's baptism in just a moment. But you know what? There's no reason for you to live, for you to leave here today, not knowing where you'll spend your eternity. Carson's made a great decision. So has many others. But what about you? Today's your day. If the Lord's speaking to you, all I can ask you to do is to be obedient.